You may be seated. All right. Amen. Thank you, Han. Thank you, team. Wow, what a great song. Amen. So good to see you this morning. Uh, exciting day today. Uh, we are welcoming Rolando Aguirre. Maybe you've heard that and his family. And uh, man, we are excited. There's going to be a reception right after the service. But welcome and to all of our guests again. We're so glad that you're here. Some of you are, uh, are not old enough to remember th a thing back in the 90s, about the mid-90s. It was a thing called boredom. Some of you are old enough to remember this? Um, I remember Stacy and I had a line with our kids when, when they would say, Mom, Dad, I'm bored. We, we would always say, no, you're not. No, 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 no. You're too smart to be bored. That was our thing. Get creative. You know, play. Uh, create something. Make something. Go outside and play. Or play with your siblings. Yeah, that'd be a good thing. Or uh, we got crayons. Draw something. We got Play-Doh. Eat some Play-Doh. I mean, play with, <laughs> play with some Play-Doh, right? Um, that was a thing back in the day. It was, it was boredom. And then something happened. I mean, I remember, I remember uh, being, I'm old enough to remember this. How about this? When, uh, when you'd be standing in line, let's say at Starbucks or somewhere, you're standing in line, or at the post office. That was a thing, too. Like, people went to post offices. And you'd stand in line, often a long time, you'd stand in line, and you would just stand in line. <laughs> or be in the elevator and just stand there. Like, look at people. Some stranger would talk to you. You'd be like, I, okay, well, I don't know, even know you. Or I'd be the one talking to everybody. Hey, what's up? You know. Um, but, yeah, that was a thing. That's a real thing. It was, it was boredom. Now, it's not that you can't still be bored because boredom is not having nothing to do. Boredom is having, how about this, not having something meaningful to do. So you can still be bored. But here's the deal. We wouldn't stand there and immediately be checking our phone, you know, texting somebody, or checking email, seeing what's on Netflix, what, you know, getting, a, getting a ticket for a movie. that you know, We wouldn't, you, we're taking a picture, I'm at the post office. You know, <laughs> we wouldn't do that. You would just stand there and just like, I mean, even like in families, we'd do this. Like you'd, you'd be sitting there, and I mean, you know, you'd watch television or whatever, but you would sit around the table like dinner and you'd actually, yeah, like wow, like talk to each other, like real people. It was a thing. And, and, and we, we wouldn't have our phones, our screens. There was none of that. No distractions. Thomas Merton who's an American monk, was, uh, he's passed away, but my favorite monk, theologian, writer, uh, social activist, we think of monks hanging out, you know, off somewhere, but as we'll learn today, we, we go in to, to come back out. He said this back in the 50s, he said, uh, Christians should have quiet homes. I love that. Christians should have quiet homes, or if you're single, you know, have a quiet place. We should have a quiet place. He advocated in the 50s. He advocated for throwing out televisions. He said radio is useless. Because he saw what was happening even then to our society, to our families, to our relationships. And so, so here's the thing, in, in a word for parents for just a moment. We ought to be so centered, I often talk about it, that non-anxious presence in the home. We should get still and quiet and we should help our children find a harbor of rest, a place of safety in the home. I remember being like in a car or even in an airplane. Again, some of y'all are, are old enough to remember this, but like just being a, like in an airplane and you finish reading a book, like a book, I mean like a real book. And then you, and if you didn't have the window seat, like you just sit there, like look at the seat in front of you. Or if you had a window seat, you could just look outside, look down, you're, you know, just looking around. And some of y'all are thinking, like, man, our pastor is like a caveman. I mean, he just, he looked like a caveman. Um, but no, it, it, was, it was before all of the distractions. But here's my point. Those moments that seemed kind of meaningless or boredom, those moments of boredom, were moments that we could actually enter into kind of, kind of the space we're in, the place we're in, take it all in. It was actually a portal into moments where we could think about life and and the great love of God and the goodness of God, there were opportunities for us to connect with each other. And we've lost a lot of that in our day today. And today we're going to hear the word of our Lord Jesus. Here's why we're here today. 
as we walk through this practicing the way of Jesus, we're going to hear his words over and over again throughout this series. I'm asking you to memorize this chapter 11 out of Matthew uh, 28 through 30. It says this. In fact, let's say it together. You'll see it there on the screen together. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Okay, stop for just a moment. Anybody need rest today? Anybody. Right? Anybody need to get away from the noise, from the distractions? Because here's the thing we're going to learn today, and you've, if you've been in connect groups, you've already been thinking about this. There's an external silence or quiet, but there's, there's an inner quiet and a peace that comes. Let's go on. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Rest for the soul. Isn't that what you need? Maybe you're watching this at home or in one of our other venues or outside the, the, the walls of this place. But we just encourage you to join in and listen to what God might be doing in your heart. Again, you can still get bored, but something happened. Uh, it was June the 27th, 2007. I remember the first time that year I saw my first iPhone. My friend Matt had one, and it was like the coolest design ever. I was like, man, this is really, this is crazy. Like, we had cell phones, right? But, like, man, this is amazing. Like, you can touch it and stuff. And, and even, even uh, how about this? Steve Jobs had no idea where this thing was going. As smart as he was, he had no idea. I mean, it was still just a phone, essentially. It had other things on it. But it was a phone and a camera, like in one. It was amazing. But there was a feature on the phone that changed everything. It was the feature to take on third-party apps applications and that is what has changed our lives and I could argue not always for the better right now we have computers in our pockets and uh, research tells us that 77 percent of us when we have nothing to do in the moment what we used to call boredom we turn to our phones 77 percent of us and I'm spending a moment here talking about this because this is a big deal. For some of you, if your phone is in the room, it is over there going, pick me up, pick me up, pick me up, pick me up, is what it's doing. Shouting at you. Cal, Cal Newport, in his book, Digital Minimalism, it's a thing. There's a movement now, even in Silicon Valley and other places, in the, the subtitle, Choosing a Focused Life in a Noisy World. It's not a, not a Christian book. He, he notes that companies now have attention engineers. They, they, they're learning. They draw from principles in, in Las Vegas casinos and, and among other places they, 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 so that they can make our devices as addictive as possible. And here's why. We now have a thing that's called the digital attention economy. And it works this way. The entire goal is profit extracted from your attention and your data. Now, there's much talk about data and such, but, but, but they, they, they want to capture and keep your attention. And so now, here's what's happening. You're not the customer. Think about it. And, if you, and I know that's not everybody here, but if you're on social media, whatever, Facebook, or you know, what'd you pay for Instagram this month? You paid nothing. You know what? You're not the customer. You're the product. They're selling your attention they're selling your focus, and the more addicted you become to your screens and to your stuff, the more money they make. And Satan has sifted us like wheat. And today is the great challenge for us to open up our hearts to the goodness of God and to really engage in the moment. I've talked about my word for the year, presence. To be faithful, to be a faithful presence right where God has placed you. So here it is. Is there a countercultural practice? Because as believers, we ought to be completely countercultural in the way we live. And one of the ways that we can do this is to practice a rule of life. Practice this thing of solitude that we see in the life of Jesus. This might be the most subversive countercultural practice of all the disciplines we're looking at. Because this one is rare to find. 
Richard Foster, in his book, The Celebration of Discipline, one of my top five books of all time, by the way, every Christian ought to read this book. Some of, a lot of our leaders are reading it right now. But our adversary, the devil, he says, measures in three things, noise, hurry, and crowds. If he can keep us involved in muchness and manyness, he will rest satisfied. How about that? Satan resting while we're not because we're captured by all the noise. The deceiver, he, he traffics in noise, hurry, and crowd. So we need to follow our rabbi Jesus into the place of solitude. I'm going to call it in silence. Some would add stillness. Henry now in a great little book called Out of Solitude, he writes this. It is in this solitude that we discover that being is more important than having. And that we are worth more than the results of our efforts. In solitude, we discover that our life is not a possession to be defended, but a gift to be shared. Now, here's the thing. I know I'm talking to, there's like some introverts in the room, about half of us. I don't know. Maybe not. It's a smaller percentage, isn't it? But because you feel alone. I know. Sometimes. But you're okay with that. Right? Um, and so what happens is like introverts, are, introverts among us are going, man, solitude, I got this. Like, I'm a, I, don't, I'm a, I mean, like, I want a lot of, so, like, I don't even like people. So this is, I, I'm, I'm all about this. And the rest of us, like me, we can learn from the introverts among us. Because extroverts, we got to be with people. we got to be out there. And, and what, what uh, Nowen is saying here is this. It, your life is not a, 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 a thing to be defended. In other words, stay away from me. You know, like, get out of here. This is not solitude. As we're going to see today, there's this interchanging uh, kind, of, or, 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 or kind of life that comes in and out. It's life of intense moments of ministry and service to others and then intense moments with the Father. And we're going to see this, and I want you to turn to Mark chapter 1 because we find it here in this passage. This is a, an amazing passage of Scripture. Right here, we're going to look at the, the work of Jesus in his first day on the job. How about this? His new job as Messiah, all right? This reads uh, as a compressed time period, very compressed. In fact, it reads as one day. So hang on to that thought because he enters into his first day on the job. Uh, so what we have here, you can see there at Mark chapter 1. Everybody turn in there. Um, you have John the Baptist. Mark is interesting. It, it enters straight into the ministry of John the Baptist. Uh, it goes straight into the, the ministry of Jesus. In fact, you see this word, immediately this happened. And then immediately this happened. It's a book of action. And so John bab is baptizing. Jesus goes to be baptized in uh, Mark chapter 1. And, and, and then, then after he's baptized. And by the way, Jesus is not baptized because he needed to be baptized like us. I mean, a, pro a profession of our faith. He's baptized because it's really a foretelling of his entire life. We talked about it last week, not just across death, but across life. He's died to himself. He's raised again. And, and this is now the call for us to die to ourselves, be raised up in him. So he, he goes as a foreshadowing of what is to come. And then in verse 11, you might know this. And a voice came from heaven. You are my beloved son. With you, I am well pleased. I love this. This is the primary storyline of his life. And if you're in Christ, if you've received grace, his grace, and you're living in him, you're forgiven, this is your primary storyline as well. So think about this. Before miracle one, he's done nothing. And the father blesses the son to secure his identity in relationship with the father. And I want you to see that in solitude, I love Nowen's book, Out of Solitude, even, right? I want you to see three things. In solitude, we fight our battles. That's something you don't expect to see or to find. In solitude, we forge our identity. And in solitude, in the end, we find, we find Jesus. And so let's look at this. First of all, we fight our battles. You see in Mark chapter 1, uh, really verses 12 through 13, you know, solitude, before we get there, is such a rare thing. A lot of us, even if you've entered into study about this in recent days, uh, you're kind of like, I don't even know what solitude is. What does that mean? Sounds kind of strange. That's why we say kind of solitude, silence, somewhat add stillness. Jean-Paul Sartre said this. He said, if you're lonely when you're alone, you're in bad company. See, some of us don't want to go be alone because, because we fear being alone. In fact, that's why solitude is hard for some of us. Why all the noise? Why do we always have to have, you know, the earbuds or, the, or something going? Why do we always have to have music everywhere you go? Why do we have noise? Why is it we don't know what to do when we get alone and we get quiet? 
And that's the trouble for many of us. This is what may be the most challenging discipline of all. Because we, we're like Pavlov's dogs. We just keep running to noise because we, we don't know what to do. And we stop our minds and we don't know what to do anymore. Or it can lead us to a very dark place, the dark night of the soul. But Foster says this. He says, loneliness is inner emptiness. Solitude is inner fulfillment. And that's what I want you to see today. See, a lot of us think that solitude is a me time. Like, good, I'm away from everybody, you know, I'm going to be chilling, uh, I'm going to binge on Netflix. I love this. I mean, this is fantastic. Don't have to see anybody. I'm going to do my thing. That's not what solitude is. I mean, yes, it's me time alone, but it's time coming into relationship and the presence of God. That's what it is. That's why often solitude is, yes, in the word. It's praying, it's seeking his face, but it's being quiet. But it's also the place where we face our demons, it's a place where we face down evil in our lives. This is why solitude can also be a dark place. So look at what happens in Mark 12, uh, 1, uh, verse 12, 13. The Spirit immediately drove him out of the wilderness. This is after his baptism, okay? Security, I mean, identity is secure. He's ready to go. And he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. Now, we don't often think of solitude as being a place where you fight the devil and wild beasts are among you. And yet for many of us, when we get quiet, that's exactly what's going on in our minds and in our sinful hearts. So in solitude, we come clean before God. We're just honest before him. So 40 days, he's fasting before he enters into ministry, and his, his life as, as he was called to live and then ultimately to die on a cross for us. So I want to encourage you with this. There's teaching in our, in our um, guide, our de devotional guide, that we put together for you on fasting at the back end of it. I want to challenge all of us, as I have all of us, to fast. Fast in some way, some form. You can join me, fast on Mondays. You can, you can pick a day that's best for you. You can skip lunch across the week. Because what happens, again, Pavlov's dog, it's 11.45, i got to think about lunch. It's almost 12, i got to eat. I mean, I'm not hungry, but i got to eat. And then 6, got to eat because it's 6. We do this. And I challenge you, every one of us, to enter into the discipline of fasting. You'll find some, some guide there for you. Uh, if you haven't picked up our, um, our guide, you need to get one. We have them here today, okay? So, uh, so here's what happens. Jesus goes, watch this. He goes from... Uh, his baptism, where his identity is secure, the father lays it out there for him, and immediately the tempter comes to him. And look, the question is this, are you sure? Are you sure that you are who the father claims you are? And this is the great tension in our lives as well. So out of solitude, he goes into the wilderness and immediately he's tempted. Now this word, this word wilderness, I want you to hang on to because it's key here. The word is eremos. Everybody say eremos. Eremos. Okay, over lunch. This week, you can impress your friends. It's a Greek word, and it means, it means solitude, solitary place. It could mean barren place. It's generally wilderness or, or off to a solitary place. In the Eremos, it's where Jesus would go. You see it often. We see it in, just in this chapter is why we've chosen this first chapter alone. Just right out of the gate, he is into, into uh, er, the Eremos, back into ministry, back into Eremos. And so we see this pattern that should be ours as well. But often, see what happens in the Eremos is our loneliness for us is exposed. And we find ourselves, man, we don't want to be alone because we're faced with our junk. But here's the thing. Your stuff is going to come out at some point, it can come out in healthy ways before the Father. It, it, it can leak out, or it'll come out in very unhealthy ways. And, and it's in the Eremos that we get real and we get honest with God. And we all must. So in the Eremos, we confess our sin. Someone said that mental health, this is true about spiritual health, mental health is coming to grips with reality at all costs. And it's in the Eremos that this happens. Because, our, our, again, it's kind of, we're, we're exposed. I, I, I thought of um, 1 Kings chapter 19. You might remember the story of Elijah, where he's, he's on the run, and he's believing things that are not really true. Uh, I mean, someone said that, you know, if you're paranoid, just because you're paranoid doesn't mean somebody's not out to get you, right? Uh, and there was at some point for him, but he enters into the, the, the Eremos. 
He runs off and he finds himself in a cave and he goes to a really, really dark place. I mean, like depressed. He wants to die. But in the Aramos, as he comes to grips with himself and with the Lord and the truth about his life, who he is, and that God has a plan for him, he comes out of the Aramos, having heard, if you know the story, the still, small voice, the whisper of God. You see, it's in the Aramos that we hear the whisper of God. Here's what I know is true about my life. When I stop, get quiet, God speaks. When I don't, he doesn't. Oh, he'll speak. I mean, uh, it'll mostly be my own consequences that'll lead me to, to, to fall on my back before him and say, Lord, I need you. And he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah I know. You should have you know, been coming to me all along. And so we enter into this pattern in and out. But look at this. This is one long marathon day. He's up early. Keep tracking there. He's up early teaching in the synagogue. There's a demonized man, possessed man. The healing of Peter's mother-in-law. That's verse 30. If you're tracking with me here, then up late healing the sick and demonized in, in verse 32, he's, he must be exhausted. He's fully God, but he's fully man. He's got to be exhausted. And then watch, watch this in solitude. Okay. We fight our battles, but here it is. We forge our identity. Now watch what happens. I chose this word forge. I love this word because it means to form or to make, especially through concentrated effort. And that's really the point of solitude. What is life without focus? We've talked about this. You can't, you can't worship without focus. You can't love without focus. I've talked about how, how attention is the beginning of devotion. Mary Oliver said that. And then I thought, wow, focus is the beginning of worship. You can't love others if you're not focused. And so many of us are so distracted that it leads to anxiety that, that can also lead to a depression that we've got to get focused. And so we forge our identity. We remind it of who we are and whose we are when we come into the Aramis. So look at verse 35. And rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place. That's the word, Aramis. And there he prayed. So he's not just walking around. I mean, he's, he's praying. And, and, and Simon and those who were with him uh, were ser searched for him. And, and they, they found him and they said to him, hey, everyone's looking for you. And he said to them, let us go out into, on into the next towns that, that I may preach there also. For that is why I, I've come. That's why I came out. That's why, I, why I'm here. And he went throughout all Gal uh, Galilee, preaching in the synagogues and casting out demons. Now think about this, for almost 40, 40 days, well, 40 days, almost, almost like a month and a half, he's in the Aramos. He comes into Capernaum for one day, he's back out in the Aramos. You see how, see how important this is to Jesus? And what makes us think that it's not important for our spiritual health and our, our vibrancy, that our lives would flourish in this kind of pattern? So all the disciples come to him, he's hiding out, I mean, not hiding out, he's praying, He's not hiding out, but, but he, he's out there praying and the disciples come to him. Everybody's looking for you. And I think they probably had a hostile tone as if to say, we know what you ought to be doing. And I don't know if you ever feel that way. You probably have, right? I mean, everybody's looking for you. Like that was my, that was Wednesday for me, right? Um, love, love, love you all. Love shepherding the church. But, uh, but no, for, how about every preschool mom in here is going, uh, every day, pastor, thank you. No, that's my day, every day. And you're like hiding out in a closet in a fetal position. <laughs> you know, your kids can't find you. Uh, that's not solitude either, but it's, it could help, I guess, for a little season there. But um, everybody wants you. And, and a lot of us can relate to this, that people are coming at us all the time. But look at what Jesus does. This is amazing. Their tone is kind of, where have you been? But watch this. Jesus answers. You see it there? Hey, let's go to the next town and preach because that's why I've been called. That's why I'm out here. That's what I do. This is Jesus for no. You're not going to tell me what to do. And I don't think he had that tone, but I mean, he, didn't. he didn't have it at all. He just lived, lived his life. He says, no, out of the Aramis, I know who I am. I know whose I am. I'm reminded of the Father's purpose for me. 
bam, I'm out not to do what you want me to do. Because watch this. If you don't know your purpose, your identity, there are plenty of people who want to tell you what it ought to be. And Jesus knows who he is out of the Eremos. And he says, nope, I know exactly what the Father wants me to do. And it's not that we're running from people. We're set on God's purpose for our lives. You can see how solitude is such an act of rebellion. Not, again, not against people, but a life driven, not, not driven by everybody else. And some of us have got to get centered on the priority of our lives. We talk about this a lot. Not priorities, but the thing that God's called us to. And that is to pursue him. So Robert Sarah, a, a, a bishop, called called this the dictatorship of noise. He says, solitude is a rebellion against the dictatorship of noise. And we need to see it this way. This is why it's such a subversive act. It's such a rebellious, countercultural act. Again, Thomas Merton for the win, he says this, silence is a protest and reparation against the sin of noise. I love that. Man, this is really been speaking into my heart in these days. Jesus says, no, let's go elsewhere. He's white hot focused on who he is. Friends, so many of you uh, were so hurried and busy and running crazy because we don't stop to, Lord, remind me again. I mean, every time I step into worship and I'm kind of preaching to the proverbial choir here, it's why it's so important that we're together every week in worship. It's why every day I come before the Lord in my home, I know I don't have kids at home, but I'm up early, it's quiet, I'm in the word, I'm seeking his face. And my prayer is always, Lord, remind me again of how much you love me. Now I'm ready, let's go. To stay in him and to live in that, there's clarity, there's power, there's purpose in the Eremos. I was telling our young staff team, we gathered this week and I told them the greatest bit of information or, or encouragement I received from a, a man who mentored me many years ago as a young minister heading in the seminary. He said, Jeff, the mo one thing, one thing. He said, the most important thing about your ministry and the stuff you will do will be your personal time alone with God every day. And I took that and I've sought to live that every day in my life. And it's true for you too. Not simply because I'm a minister, not because he's a son of God, he needed to do this. If Jesus needed to do it, we all need to do it, right? But look at what happens here. It says in, in uh, verse, look at this, verse 40, verse 40 uh, to 44, he's, he's healing a man. Keep following with me in verse 45. It says this, but he went out and began to talk freely about it. So he told this guy, don't tell anybody. This is he, is the healed man. He runs around telling everybody and, and to spread the news because you, you, know, you can't keep good news to yourself so that Jesus could no longer openly enter a, a town but was out in the desolate places, there it is, in the Aramos and people were coming to him from every quarter. Like that means from the east, the west, north, the south. And see, we live out of solitude. We fight our battles. We forge our identity. But I want you to see this. The main reason that we go into the Eremos is to find Jesus because that's where he is. Now look at this. I want you to jump to chapter six. Jump to chapter six. Okay, turn there because we're going to look at now a lot's happened. All right, his ministry is rolling. Uh, he's become even more popular, but he's been teaching parables. John the Baptist actually dies and he sends out, Jesus sending out his disciples. So he's got all these disciples he's raising up and sending out. And we're going to see not only are we practicing his way, living this way, but we actually find him in the quiet place. Look at verse 30. Now I'm in chapter 6. The apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, come away by yourselves. Now he's, he's telling them, come away to a desolate place. There it is, to the Aramas, and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. You ever had been so busy you can't even eat? Some of you are like, no, no way. That will never happen to me. Um, it's happened to me. Like Stacey will say, what would you have for lunch? I didn't even eat. Wow, 
I didn't eat. I didn't even think about that. And they went away into the boat to a desolate place, to the Aramos by themselves. So they get in the boat. Picture this. They're going across to a desolate place. Jesus calls them out to go and be with him and to do what he's been doing. See, here's what's happening. This is discipleship. Watch me do this. Come along with me and do it. All right, now I'm going to watch you do it. We're going to kind of debrief and then you, you go do that. And then, by the way, teach others also. That's discipleship. That's as simple as it is. And so he calls them away, right? And then then the story's not over. Because solitude is never a thing, and catch this, never a thing where we just say, we're just just turn inward on my needs, what I want, what I want to do, and and, and let me just go hide out. I love this. This is a great discipline. I love this discipline. But, But that's not what's happening here. He calls them out. But then he's going to send them back out. You see the rhythm here. I've already talked about it. It's why um, when I spend time with the Lord, and this is true, when I've got my time alone, I'm going to be a better husband. I'm going to be a better father. I'm going to be a better son, friend. I'm going to be a better pastor. It's why Dietrich Bonhoeffer said this in his classic book, Life Together. He had one one chapter titled uh, The Day Together. He had another one entitled The Day Alone, the very next chapter. Because he writes this, look at this. Let him who is not in community beware of being alone. Each by itself has profound perils and pitfalls. One who wants fellowship without solitude plunges into the void of words and feelings. You just focus in, center in on yourself. That make you crazy. And the one who seeks solitude without fellowship perishes in the abyss of vanity, self-infatuation, and despair. He's saying we need accountable relationships. And we also need a pattern, ongoing pattern of being alone. We forget ourselves in solitude. We're able to turn to the needs of others, right? I hope that's the pattern of your life. If you're not in a group, if you're not doing life with other believers, friends, you're out of whack. Or if you're all about doing and then just not simply being. Look at verse 33. Look what happens. Now, many saw them going and recognized them. Check it out. They run on foot around this, you know, whatever, this body of water, all the towns, and they got there ahead of them. Like they're going, wait, we just left these people. Here they are. They can't get away. This is real life though, right? They're chasing them down. All of your priorities, right? All your stuff, all the things you got to do. Like, you know, our moms, like our dads, all the kids, stay away from me. I came in here to get away from you, right? And, and, and they just running them down. And then it says in verse uh, 34, when he went ashore, he saw a great crowd. Now watch Jesus. And he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. I love this. The disciples wanted to get away with Jesus. But watch this. Don't miss this. The people wanted to get away with Jesus. They wanted Jesus. They knew somehow he was the answer to their problems, to their challenges, to their trouble in life. Look at verse 35. And when it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, this is a desolate place. (laughs) He's like, this is the Aramos. We love being in the Aramos. And the hour is late. Send them away. That would be good. Send them away uh, into the surrounding countryside and villages. and, and, And so they can buy themselves something to eat. Send them like, I don't know, down to the Jerusalem Chipotle or or something. I mean, let them go. Let them go get their own food. But watch this. But he answered them, you give them something to eat. What? And and, and they're thinking, "We, we got nothing. The disciples are saying, send them away. Jesus is saying, hey, no, watch this. Out of the Aramos, out of solitude, you go and serve and watch what I will do. I mean, this is incredible. Intense moments of solitude, intense moments of ministry. And then in the latter part of verse 37, they say, hey, should we just go like buy 200 denarii worth of, of, of bread? In our day, that's like $170, $76 is what they claim. Uh, not a lot of money, but, it, but back then it was a lot of money. I mean, they're saying like, should we just go to Costco, buy bulk and just feed these people and just be done with them? And Jesus says, no, 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 no. What do you have? Well, they got five loaves and two fish. Jesus goes, that's enough. See, watch this. In solitude, we realize that we're walking along in this life with a miracle worker. In solitude, you are with the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Friends, see, there's two dimensions here. 
All, this is the Christian life. Time alone with the Lord, reminding us, Lord, through your word, give me the truth about who I am, and then going forth and living this life for him and touching lives. He says, watch this. I'm going to do a miracle through your life as you go and serve others. Can you see now? Silence is a non-negotiable for the believer. It's why Henry Nouwen said this. Without silence, it is virtually impossible to live a spiritual life. We do not take the spiritual life seriously if we do not set aside some time to be with God and listen to him. So we're going to close our service in a really special way. I don't know what it is for you, but I want to ask you again. Are you, soul, are you weary today? Are you tired, hurried, and worried? There's a solution and I want to challenge you towards it. So let's put all of our stuff down. Just go ahead and put your, whatever you're, you're looking at, some of you are on your phone. Put your phone down and uh, put your Bible down. And the team's going to come up here. But I want us to pray together. So let's just, let's just bow our heads and close our eyes right now. And we're going to enter into a moment uh, to set our hearts on, on the week ahead. This is a challenge to you to practice. These are all practices. You have to do something. You don't just leave it here. You do something this week, and I'm going to encourage you to, to, to get the devotional guide if you don't already have it. They're out in the commons. We have them available all over. They're outside the doors here. Just grab one. What will it be for you this week? Think about it as you come before the Lord right now. Maybe it'll be getting up early, which means going to bed earlier. Maybe it means not turning on your phone until you've been in the Word. You've been in prayer. Maybe it's a walk in a park. Maybe it's sitting down on a bench somewhere alone with your thoughts before the Lord. Just to pray and to seek his face. I want us now to just, before we close our time, singing together. Because here's the truth. Some of us don't need to just think about it. We don't need to just come to the Father maybe later. We need to run to the Father right now. And some of you are here today and you don't have peace in your soul because you've never received Christ and his grace that he offers. He died on the cross for you. He said, it is finished. You can rest in me. And now he calls us. He says, come all ye who weary and are heavy laden. I'll give you rest. So right now, just right where you are, I just want us all palms up. Would you just put your hands in front of you, maybe on your knees, or just put them up? What are you anxious about? What are you worried about? Just release your life to him. Say, Lord, I'm yours. And in a moment of silence, just take it all in. What is he saying to you? What are you going to do about it? So right now, just silence before the Lord.